Welcome back to Beyond the Wrench. My name is Jay Ganinen, and I am your host. Today, I'm excited to share an episode with you that I filmed a few weeks ago with my friend Cole Strandberg, who is the principal at Focus Investment Banking. During this episode, Cole and I dive into how he and his family are helping shops navigate the many challenges that come with the merger and acquisition process when selling shops. I apologize in advance for some of the audio issues we had during this recording, but there is still a ton of really, really good information in this episode, and I hope you enjoy it. Cole, welcome to the show. You've got uh, a pretty fascinating background. You've been around the industry for a long, long time, grew up in the industry like I did, and uh, I'm really looking forward to learning more about you and uh, what you do. I think when we talk about M&A, that uh, it throws a whole bunch of questions out there, and it, it should be a fun show. So uh, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Big fan and uh, looking forward to a great com- conversation. So tell me about how you got started. Uh, it, it's uh, As I mentioned, uh, probably like a lot of us in the industry at a young age uh, got involved, but uh, maybe in a little bit of a, a different aspect. So wa- walk me through your uh, growing up story. Yeah, absolutely. Like you mentioned, a lot of similarities there for sure between the two of us. I grew up sort of in the periphery, I'll call it, of the collision repair industry. My dad started a business back in 1988 that began as a a filter company, evolved into a paint booth filter company, and eventually an equipment provider for the automotive industry. So grew up around that uh, since childhood, never really like a lot of people in our industry with family businesses, never really had a desire to go at least straight into the business, liked it, loved it, appreciated it for what it was, but it was sort of a big brother as much as a family business, very involved and uh, ended up going to school, went to undergrad and had in my mind that I wanted to go be an investment banker and ended up doing that. Went to a a boutique investment bank out of Boca Raton, Florida called Noble Capital Markets. Did that for a period of time. And eventually the family business came calling. And and when the family business comes calling, you pretty much have to answer it. And ended up joining. There was some acquisition interest from some big players within the industry on the paint side for this equipment business that had become a really, really nice, well thought of business in the space and thought, A, given my background in banking, I should be able to be of some assistance here and B, selfishly really wanted to go through that M&A process as a seller. I had seen it as an intermediary, as someone on the sidelines, but I really wanted to go through that and see it through the eyes of a seller. And so we did, unbeknownst to me, we ended up not going with that partner and it took about three years to actually make a transaction happen. So we walked away from that deal, decided to hit the reset button, aligned with an investment bank and ran a full process and ended up finding the right partner with the growth goals and the ideals that lined up with my families and my kind of view on the business and on the industry and really highlighted the importance for me of finding the right partner. And Following that acquisition, these guys had the pedal down. We ended up, we were a platform for, for this private equity firm. We ended up making six add-on acquisitions in under two and a half years, quadrupled revenue, quadrupled headcount, just really a fun example of, of how private equity, when you have that right partnership, can be such a great thing for a small to medium-sized business. Fast forward three years after the sale, I stayed with the company for three years, as did my entire family, which was a true family affair. By the way, it was my dad, my mom, my now wife, and myself all working together, an incredible experience. Uh, ended up making the leap after three years following the sale into mergers and acquisitions, specifically within the automotive aftermarket, and a real focus on collision repair specifically. And that's where I am today and love every minute. It's a really cool story. And I'm sure you've learned so much over the course of that time, uh, initially getting involved with the service business and and really when you look at it from the M&A side how much patience was required in those early days because I'm sure when you go through all of that work with the initial partner and maybe that doesn't come to fruition and then it's another three years beyond that uh, there's got to be some level of of patience there I would assume an incredibly high level you're, you're spot on there are some nights during an M&A process that y- you lose sleep. It's a buzzkill. It's, uh, 
you're in mourning. The deal's dead. It hurts. It's no fun. And you thought you were so close and now it's, it's so far away. And frankly, it's helped immensely in my role now to empathize with the sellers of businesses. This is an extension in many cases of a business owner's family. It's been the, the breadwinner for the family. There's a, an extreme emotional attachment to the business itself, plus the employees. And it takes a toll when you're going through a process that can take anywhere from on the super short side, call it three months, on the lengthier side, a year to 18 months. So you're spot on with patience and the ups and downs. It's a roller coaster. The roller coaster is hard to ride too, right? Because in a lot of ways, folks have spent, you know, it, years and years, their blood, sweat, and tears of putting their heart and soul into these businesses and having that extra time added to what you might perceive as the end can be a real challenge. And I think it, it's uh, it's something that until you go through it, you probably really don't understand what it's all about. I'd equate it to running a marathon. And when you're running a marathon, you get to that, what is it, 26.2? And, and you have not another step left in you. Now imagine you get to 26.2 and the finish line moves another mile. It becomes mentally very, very challenging to deal with. And it's, it's such an important aspect of M&A is, is ensuring you have someone on your team, an investment banker, M&A advisor, who's going to help try to avoid those and foresee these pitfalls. And, and they're still out there. No one can, can 100% avoid some of those. But becomes important because it is a drain. And, and something too that's important during the M&A process is it's very time consuming, but you also can't take your eye off the ball from an operations perspective. You can't have those sales numbers dip. You can't have those profitability numbers dip. You have to be very focused on keeping it steady and growing. For those, uh, we, we've got an audience that listens to this that has a technical background, might even be a technician right now, and when we say M&A, mergers and acquisitions, and, and really going through the process of uh, some type of change in your business ownership, to take that, I guess, st a step further, what starts the process? I mean, wh when you're looking at maybe potentially going through the process and knowing how long of a road it, it could potentially be, and maybe you're that, that business owner out there that's looking for the next step in your life. Uh, how does that process work? So this might be a long answer. Uh, yeah. I, I will do my best to condense it, but I will tell you how it works with my team and I, and, and, and with a caveat, it's going to vary a fair bit with different firms, different types of businesses. My firm is called Focus Investment Banking. We are one of the most active investment banks in the lower middle market. And typically the definition of lower middle market is companies with enterprise values of between five and a hundred million dollars. Our firm is a little bit unique in that we are generalist in that we cover a lot of industries, but we have teams that are very, very specialist by nature. So my partner and I and two other members of our team are senior bankers exclusively focused on the automotive aftermarket. So we have a very deep understanding in the businesses we represent. So we hope that that process can run a little bit smoother given the focus there and the experience there and the many deals we've done. From a timeline perspective and a process perspective, fortunately, many business owners listening here are in a business from a shop perspective that is being consolidated pretty aggressively. With consolidation, you typically get some relatively standardized valuation multiples. You also, by working with an investment bank that knows the space, have a resource that knows exactly what buyers are looking for, and they can really expedite that process. So typically for a, a standalone equipment business, for example, it's pretty complex. Your buyers are going to be one of many, and you have to really build a story from scratch. At the shop level, again, the buyer pool is, is pretty well known to an experienced investment bank and exactly what they're looking for is. So from a shop's perspective, a timeline there is typically all in going to be as short as three months, which is rare, uh, to as long as, as nine to 12 months on the really, really long end. So a, a pretty shortened process just with the nature of these businesses. And how we work, very first step is 
NDA, non-disclosure agreement, anything you share stays between us. From there, we request some high-level financials and information about the business. And together, the team at Focus puts together a valuation range of what we believe that business to be worth in the open market. Now, something to keep in mind, and this is a key difference between an investment bank and a business brokerage, we will not set a price tag. We don't want to limit the upside of a business. We want to find the buyer who is A, going to pay the most money and also A, going to be a, a great cultural fit. And so we want to really run a full process that's going to allow the cream of the buyers to rise to the top and ensure that, you know, typically business owners are only selling their business once, maybe twice in their lifetime if they're fortunate. So we want to do it the right way. At the point of valuation, prospective sellers have, have signed nothing beyond the NDA. Uh, essentially, that valuation is to educate them. They've, they've not engaged in any way. But as we present that valuation, we, if it's a good fit, we'll share why we believe that's the case and hopefully get the ability to work with those sellers to run a process. From there, our work begins. We do a deep dive into the financials. We put the financials in the best possible light for the company. We tell the company's stories. This M&A is so much finance, but it's even more storytelling. The, the qualitative stuff is so important. And we put together what's called a confidential information memorandum uh, or shorthand a SIM that's going to be 15 to 45 pages deep dive insight into the company. Simultaneously, we'll, we're developing a buyer target list. Our sellers need to sign off on every buyer we bring it to before we do. There are no business listing sites that we put this on. For us, that confidentiality, that secrecy is, is so important and keeping that on the down low is, is huge. From there, our goal is to run the process and drive the process essentially while the business owner is allowed to keep their eye on the ball and keep crushing it. Wrenchway is excited to announce the launch of Tech Mission local events starting September 18th to select cities across the country. These week-long virtual events will bring together local automotive and diesel communities to empower technicians and industry professionals to express open and honest feedback about the industry, showcase shops that exemplify best practices, and to recognize individuals who are making a positive impact on the industry and their local community. Plus, we'll be giving away over $10,000 in prizes. There's no cost for technicians, service advisors, and other individuals working in the industry to participate, and all activities during the week can be completed on your own time. There are sponsorship opportunities available for shops and dealerships who want to get in front of the technicians in their area and help promote and improve the industry. Registration is free and now open. Go to Wrenchway.com, click the local chapter link, and select your city to learn more and pre-register. Link is in the show notes. All right. So as we're going through the process, and uh, I, I think it's kind of interesting because one one thing that you mentioned was allowing the business to keep their eye on the ball without having to kind of deal with all of that that back end noise. How hard is that for a business owner to kind of separate? Because in the back of your mind, you're like, okay, there's a bunch of stuff going on, but then also I still have to keep this thing rolling at a at a at a good rate. It's, it's hugely important. It's a challenge. It really comes down to having a great team, both internally and externally, a great deal team from an M&A advisor's perspective, from an attorney, from a CPA, as well as internally, any partners or any kind of key employees that you feel need to be looped into the process to help you run this process because you can't do it as one person. That team is going to be very important. That team aspect, I think we talk a lot on the podcast about communication and being forthright with things that are happening. Do you have any advice for somebody that might be going through the process right now and how they communicate with their team? Because you probably don't want to scare everybody up front by saying, hey, listen, we're looking at potentially selling our business that has been in, in business for 30 years. Uh, but you also at the, at some level don't want them to find out and then be feel like they were uh, not in the loop or, you know, some, you know, I, communication is such a funny thing and it's really easy to say, but it's so hard to do. Absolutely. And, and I will kind of give my input here with a caveat of 
there is no one size fit all. Each company is going to be a little bit different. Each relationship with key employees is going to be different. For me, my experience involved kind of looping in some key executives and accounting personnel within the sale of our family's business. For clients that, that might not have that executive support team, a lot of times there's this draw to, you know, hey, I need to be honest with my team and, and loop this in. And, and we in no way want to encourage dishonesty. What I would say is early to mid process is a challenging time to loop team members in because there are still many unknowns. When you don't know the partner that's coming in uh, or, or the group that's coming in specifically, they sort of become this boogeyman. Like, oh, who, who the heck's going to buy it? There are so many unknowns the mind with a lack of answers kind of makes their own. So we typically recommend at the very earliest to loop employees in once that buyer is pretty clear and LOI is, is signed, it's happening. It's good advice. It, it, it is a really, really difficult thing to manage and make sure that you're doing it. Cause I think most people probably want to make sure their team is taken care of and, and, through the process, not get them too stressed out. I think leadership in general, that's one of the hardest things because you don't want to stress your team out all the time, but also uh, you don't want to disrespect them by not, not telling them something they should know. So knowing that fine line can be a very, very difficult thing. Uh, But I do think having somebody that's been there and done it like you have uh, to coach along the way, I think can be really helpful. And, um, and if you don't have that person, find a mentor that's that's gone through that before it really talk with people and, and and learn about it i think as you mentioned before it is such a learning process and and something that you you just have to uh, like anything in life learn adapt get better and and you'll probably find yourself in a pretty good spot absolutely and to the point of the the mentorship angle i think that's perfectly said and really well thought out. And in my case, with my dad, he was a member of Vistage, uh, a business peer group, CEO network. And his mentor, the leader of his Vistage group, he will credit as just incredibly pivotable, pivotal rather, to the success of, of that transaction and, and from a wider lens, the success of the business. So such a supporter of, of peer groups, mentors. I think that's something our industries uh, across the board in the automotive technical industry is getting really good at. And it's these peer groups. I'm such a proponent of that. When, when a business looks at this, and, and this is very much from my experience in talking with shops, uh, having a people strategy is so important during this process, right? Because I don't think a business is going to want to come in or maybe an acquirer would want to come in and uh, have a mess of people or you have a high attrition rate with people. And and really, I think when you look at it through those, through the lens of the opposite person, right? Or uh, if the shoe's on the other foot, they want to see some stability and some people stability and maybe even that process to, to get people. Because if you don't have that, things can tend to fall apart. Yeah, absolutely. I would equate it to, you know, you want your books to be in good shape when it's time to sell your business. In the same way, you want your people to be in good shape. Uh, You you don't want to have any pending employee issues or any looming culture issues. It's a great catalyst wanting to sell your business to kind of get those in order to ensure you're doing right by your people, A, And frankly, to ensure you're doing right by your new partner, your buyer. People want to do good, not setting their buyer up for success isn't doing good. And I I think the people is a huge piece of that. It's fascinating to see, and I'm sure through your eyes, all of the business activity that's out there, but then... I think it might give you some inside insight to the industry as a whole, right? And being able to kind of get an, an idea of what it is that buyers find attractive, uh, what industry trends might worry potential buyers. Can you give us a little background on that side of, you know, what, what buyers love, what buyers are scared of, uh, anything? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and, a lot of different pieces to the answer. But what I would tell you is the people piece is huge. 
businesses buying businesses or investors investing in businesses, they want to know the team is of high quality to the point where what I love to see is a business owner or CEO who has really built a team that makes them not necessary. That's an incredible way to boost value when a buyer knows they don't need you specifically, they need your business. It's, it's grown far beyond you. Uh, beyond that, generally, revenue is important. EBITDA slash profitability is important, of course. That's what valuations are going to be based off of. Another thing, if you can help it as you're kind of building out your business, space in the automotive industry, facilities of larger sizes typically tend to lead to higher valuations than those of smaller. You have additional capacity. And the way valuations work in a lot of these types of businesses become when it's a strategic consolidator acquiring this business, they need to know you're making money, sure, but they also need to know how much business you can fit in your door. From there, the revenue is kind of capped out, but they know what kind of margins they can generate. So to be able to have significant revenue, to be able to have significant space to accommodate that revenue, and then to be hopefully on a trajectory of growth. You don't want to see a couple years in a row of a downward trend. It's not necessarily a killer, but it certainly hurts valuation. You want to see that nice hockey stick growth. You mentioned something that I think is really interesting, and I think it's really difficult for small business owners in general, which is to pull yourself out of the weeds and make yourself not necessary. How much of a challenge is that for most business owners? Because it is their their pride and joy, similar to your family, where it was kind of like your big brother, right? Uh, how much of a challenge is it to, to kind of get yourself out of the way? It's a challenge. And it's, it, it takes a concerted effort if you want to do it the right way. I think you can grow out of it. But at that point, to grow beyond just kind of naturally without a concerted effort of, of taking yourself out of the business takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of headache to really go in with a strategy to make that happen. Maybe to, when you can afford to do so, to overinvest in your management team. I think of on the collision repair side of some groups that have five, six, seven stores, but they have the management team equal to that of a 40 or 50 store team. And it's like, man, those guys, are going to have success because they have this thought of, hey, we've built the foundation. Now we can go crazy. And I, I think taking the CEO role kind of out of the day-to-day -day or the owner role out of the day-to-day -day is a really good way to go about doing that. What about the part with the advancements in technology? And, and I think even for that shop owner that's out there right now, it's awfully scary about what could come. Same with the acquisition side. Uh, what about the future of this industry is worrisome uh, or is it just scary because it's maybe different, you know, that, that type of thing. When you look at the vision and the forecast for our industry, what do you, what do you see out there and, and maybe any type of advice for that, that shop owner that's out there? So there's, there's good news and bad news with that. And I'll start with the bad news. I'll get it out of the way. And the bad news is, it's going to be very challenging and expensive to thrive when this environment is, is mature. With all of the technological innovations, the technician shortage, there has to be a significant investment of, of both effort and finances to make your company one that's going to be sustainable for the long term. So with that, coming from an M&A perspective, you're seeing a number of what's called in kind of the wider M&A market the silver tsunami. It's, it's the massive generational wealth transfer of, of retiring baby boomers onto business buyers, the next generation, whoever that may be. And it's largely because in, in, in the case of the automotive industry to kind of catch up with it, it's expensive. And sometimes that ROI, that runway for, for older business owners just is not there, which leads me to the good news. It's, it's that the industry is evolving at an incredible pace to something that's an incredible opportunity for businesses who are willing to invest in that. And those who are willing to keep up in investing in OEM certifications, for example, who are willing to invest in the latest and greatest technology, who are willing to invest in training and recruiting world-class technicians, the opportunities are immense. The future of this business shapes up so nicely for those people who are becoming more and more sophisticated business people by the day in this industry. 
one other point that's good news, even for those who are impacted by that first piece of bad news, the M&A world in this, the M&A market is just so right. Valuations are extremely compelling right now. The buyer pool is there. So whether you're looking to exit in the next year, two years, five years, or whether you're looking to build an empire over the next few decades, I say there's never been a better time to be a business owner in the automotive space. What are you seeing out of the consolidation world? Uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of time on the dealership side and back in, I want to say late two thousands, uh, the consolidation piece really started to take place. And it feels like we're maybe seeing that kind of follow with the independent side where, uh, you are consolidating and, or you're seeing more consolidation, uh, is that just me or is that, uh, I think, uh, the, the general environment? That You're absolutely right. That is the environment. It, it's really been over the last, call it, decade that we've seen some specifically focused on the collision repair piece. It's been about a, a decade since we've seen some of the massive players come in and really change the game. PE back, acquiring left and right. And it's shown that I think for a business that many people 20 years ago would have said, hey, this is not scalable the technician requirements, the art form that's required, it's not scalable. And, and these guys have proven that that's not the case. It is very much scalable. And there have been major success stories, the caliber collisions, Gerber, Crash Champions, Classic Collision, Joe Hudson Collision. There are many more, but those are really the, the national consolidators who are, are doing a great job at, uh, at scaling. And there's some regional consolidators now that are popping up left and right. One thing I can tell you is private equity is chomping at the bit to get into the collision repair industry if they aren't already. And there are a ton of new platforms coming in. So anticipate the rate of consolidation to only keep speeding up. Is that what changed with them was seeing the path to where consolidation can make it a big company, whereas in the past, uh, and I'm looking at this through the, the buyer's viewpoint, in the past, maybe they didn't see being able to, to take that one-off independent shop and making it a part of their network. Now they feel like they can get their, their management involved and, and their team to uplift these shops and make it a part of a, a bigger network. Yeah, absolutely. They've figured that out by and large. It's, it's, it's a science now. They know exactly what it's going to take. They know the timing to get the signage up. They know the timing to train the, the employees who are coming in. They know what type of manager to plug in. They've really gotten it down to a science, frankly. Where the magic comes in, and it's, it's super interesting for groups that are trying to scale, the magic becomes what we call a multiple arbitrage when they want to grow via acquisition. They're buying, call it X is the multiple. Uh, they're buying businesses at one half X, call it just super generality. As soon as that gets into that bigger organization, it's worth 1x or 2x or 3x, whatever that may be. And, and that makes it just very compelling to have a concerted effort to grow via acquisition for consolidators. Did you hear the news? Wrenchway is launching local chapters across the U.S., Wrenchway local chapters bring together the best shops and dealerships with schools, technicians, and other industry professionals with the goal of promoting and improving auto and diesel careers in local communities. Wrenchway's local online communities provide a detailed look at what it's like working at the best shops in the area, an effective way for schools to connect with local shops and dealerships an engaging forum for members to discuss industry topics, and a fun way to win prizes while helping industry and local schools. Wrenchway local chapters are now available in Charlotte, Dallas, Fort Worth, Denver, Detroit, Houston, Indianapolis, Madison, Milwaukee, the Twin Cities, Philadelphia, Phoenix, Portland, and Raleigh, with more chapters coming soon. Learn more and join wrenchway.com slash local dash chapters. Link is in the show notes. How much, maybe I, I should rephrase this. When you're looking at valuating a company and you've, you're talking to the seller, 
how much of a variance between what you place as a value on their business versus what they think their business is worth do you see? And the reason I ask that is I've heard some stories, especially from those that haven't gone through a succession type of process that might not be realistic in what the valuation of their business is going to be and almost put their entire retirement like plan based on that and then are disappointed when they get to the end. I, I, the reason I asked the question is not to, to uh, put you on the spot or make a, a uh, collision shop owner or any, any shop owner for that matter uncomfortable. It's that I want them to be realistic in what their valuation is going to be. It's a great question. And the answer is really all across the board. We certainly have those tough conversations early on when we're discussing valuation where and that, that does not excite me. And, and at that point, you know, fortunately, hopefully you've had that conversation a little bit early. I'd love to talk to business owners who are a year or two out where, hey, it's not where you want it to be, but plug this, this, and this in, and, 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 and it'll get you toward that. Also, fortunately, you have a lot of business owners who have a business that is worth more than they thought it would be. And this is a, 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 a potential trap, though, because as was the case with my family's business, getting an offer to sell your business, it's, it's a big number, no matter how you slice it. Chances are, it's like you start thinking about it in a reality instead of kind of a, a figment of your imagination. And one of my goals, in addition to educating sellers of, hey, you know, it's not, it's not worth as much as, as you hoped it would be is, hey, you have something really special that's worth far beyond what you would have accepted Otherwise, and again, it goes back to you're going to do this once, maybe twice in your life. When you're selling your business, make sure you really understand the value of your business and don't leave anything on the table. A driving factor to valuation, I have to imagine, are the KPIs, the, the key performance indicators in a business. When you're that, and maybe you're, say, that shop that's 10 years out, you're five years out but you want to have a better feel of your numbers and you want to have a better sense over the course of how you're building this, what that looks like in terms of valuation, what's actually going to impact, what KPIs would you have them measure and what, which ones should they be focused on? Uh, I think we could go down a really fun rabbit hole, but it would take the entire length of this episode. To <laughs> I'm of, a geek. I love this stuff. <laughs> we, we could extrapolate like a lot of different KPIs, a mentor of mine, came up with a, a program for sales reps, for example. So not, not this industry, but I love the idea of, yeah, we should compensate them for like sales, but we should also compensate them for doing the things that we know will lead to sales, if not today, tomorrow or next month or next year. And I think we could go to way down a rabbit hole to get there. But frankly, from a valuation standpoint, there's a few things that rise ab above everything else. And you want to watch revenue. You want to watch EBITDA. You want to really evaluate your facility and your personnel. And, and as we mentioned kind of at length is develop a leadership team that doesn't require you, the seller, because investors or buyers are, are for better or worse, they're wary of, hey, people say they want to stay in this business for five years, 10 years, whatever that may be. But if you get a check that's substantial and, and can send you to Mexico sipping Coronas on a beach, <laughs> that mindset could change after a bad day of work. Uh, so, so that management team and having that built out is really important and really helps buyers get comfortable with the business they're investing in. Uh, sipping Coronas on a beach doesn't sound terrible, by the way. That, uh, that pretty nice. Yeah. Sounds as we record, this me. is on a Friday afternoon and, and uh, I think, uh, that might be on everybody's mind at this point, but I, uh, as we look at this and, and you're looking at that business and you're really trying to get the most value out of it. Obviously the KPIs, the people, the people drive the KPIs. If you have good structure in place, uh, I'm curious as to if you've recommended a, a business, get a coach. Uh, and the reason I say that is that was a, a big impact for my dad's business was uh, the time, you know, at, this is six, seven years ago. He said, if somebody came in and they wanted this place, I'd hand them the keys and leave. And I'm like, dad, you've worked here for 25 years. 
and you're just going to give it up. Like that doesn't make any sense. You've put so much into this. And so we worked our way into getting a coach for him. And it was by far the most impactful thing that's ever happened to his business. He got process in place. He got structure in place. He no longer has to be there. When I was growing up, we rarely went on vacations. I think we went to Disney once uh, and that was our one vacation for me growing up. Right. And so when I look at it and if you are that business that's out there, my personal recommendation is to find a coach of some type. And I'm, I'm curious as to whether you you'd echo what I say or say something maybe even different. 100%. Yeah. I mentioned for my dad, it was a a mentor for others. It's a peer group for others. It's a a formal coach or a fractional executive of some sort. Entrepreneurship can be a very lonely journey. And I think having someone that brings a different skill set to the table, whether that's uh, an executive within your own business, whether that's a, a coach, whether that's a here who, who might be a couple years ahead of you in your journey, something like that. I think it's such a great thing to have. And I would recommend that all day. You bring up a really solid point there, which is not hiring yourself over and over and over again. That was one thing when, when I was growing this business, that was very important to me was that I hired people that weren't like me because if they were all like me, we would just talk around the office all day and nothing would actually get done. So it was more of like finding those complimentary pieces that, uh, and including my business partner, we are ex- like exact opposites in almost every way. And we kind of joke that if it wasn't for sports and beer, I don't know if we'd ever talk, but like it, it is a, um, it is one of those things that as you're looking to add to your team and especially at the management level, trying to find those folks that complement who you are, uh, rather than just trying to hire uh, your own identity over and over and over again. Very well said. I, I would add, what else is there to talk about? besides sports and beer, but <laughs> neither here nor there. I think that's, that's really well put, though, because typically that takes a concerted effort to identify people that bring a different skill set. Because I think subconsciously, CEOs and, and people in general value what they're good at beyond other things. I mean, this is something you see all the time. If a CEO values sales above all, a lot of his executives and his leaders in his business are going to be salespeople. If a CEO values accountants, if he's an accountant or she's an accountant, above all, they're going to be surrounded by a lot of accountants. And I think it really does take an effort to realize, hey, here's what I, here's what I have. Check that box. Let's go find something complimentary to add to that. And I think, to your point, that's something you did a great job and it's obviously paid dividends. I, I think... It's really important for a business leader of any size to understand what their strengths and weaknesses are as an individual. And uh, I I know I've talked to shops uh, and shop owners, general leadership, even on the dealership side that might not have that. uh, They might not think that way and, and not really understand what their weaknesses are. Uh, For me, I feel like that's been a huge tool for, for myself to understand where, I'm not good at what I need help with and then know what I am good at because that's what I'm going to keep doing. And, and when you look at it from the standpoint of understanding what you're weak at and maybe in that small business, it is accounting or it is process. You know, I suck at process. My business partner is great at process. We complement each other very, very well. But I think it's also needed in any business to to understand what you're weak at so that you you can you can build upon those other sides. Yeah, I think being self-aware is one of the most underrated attributes of a good CEO or business leader, that emotional intelligence, because if, you, if you're self-aware, too, you can. People kind of understand that if you can make light of what you're not good at and and take action about fixing what you're not good, good at, not, not necessarily fixing yourself, but building a team around your strengths to kind of backfill your weaknesses, I think is a superpower in the business world. How important is communication in a business? That's a, that's a, that's like a, it's such a loaded question. I apologize for that, but I, I, it's almost <laughs> rhetorical, but at the same level, it's like, it is a fun thing to talk through because so many people talk about it, yet so many people are bad at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, 
it's so easy to say how important it is. It's very challenging to actually kind of master that within a business. And I think the self-awareness piece really comes in. I think the emotional intelligence comes in of communication as a generality is, is good, but employees need to be communicated with differently, right? And so it's, yes, 100% communication is so important, but I think understanding what kind of communication is needed where is even more important. I was hoping you were going to say communication is actually not that important. We don't really have to worry about that. Uh, Forget it. Yeah, no yeah, need. Yeah. No especially need. in a especially in a family business, you, you, you just don't talk. That seems to work out well for everybody. Well, and that's a good point too. I, I sort of glossed over the family business experience a little bit. And as part of my role, I deal with a lot of family businesses, and they're awesome. And so many of them are great experiences. You, you tend to hear the horror stories, though, more than you hear the great experiences. And I think those great ones really need a platform because that was my favorite part of the, the job with the family was being with the family. And I think one of my, we'll call them not to put myself on a pedestal here, but one of my business superpowers was, I think, leaving the arguments at the office and not bringing them home. And that's something that I was really good at. If I disagreed with my dad or my wife, I would do everything in my power. And I was, I was typically pretty successful at leaving that and then, you know, go out to dinner and it's not readdressed until the next morning when we're back in the office. I, I love your story in that you went away from the family business first. And I've seen a lot of very successful family businesses and some big family businesses where uh, they made it a requirement of their kids to leave the business and go work for other people. I didn't do that. And looking back, hindsight's twenty twenty. I wish I would have done that all day long, right? Because it, it, some level, I started so young with my dad that I'm still that immature, you know, screw off that doesn't really take it seriously and and joking around all the time. But. I really wish I would have gone to work for other people first. And I think for those, those businesses out there that are in that dynamic, that family business dynamic right now, I think that's a heck of a good practice. I don't know your, your background was that, right? You left the family business and I think it gives you so much more perspective and so much more maturity when you come back to the business that you are actually bringing a lot of value when you come back. Yeah, I, I think there's no right or wrong answer with that, but I would not change my path, certainly out of school, going and working somewhere else with the idea that maybe I'd end up at the family business. Maybe I wouldn't, but even if I did, you know, hopefully I could develop a skill set that would bring some outside value to the table. And I want to be careful how I say this because my dad is, uh, you know, he's nationally recognized as like the best paint booth salesman in history. He, being a junior version of my father would have been great, but I didn't just want to be that. I wanted to bring something to the table rather than be a slightly worse version of, of the company's CEO. That's a really good way to say it. Politically correct, right between the lines. You, you can't make your dad upset because you came back and said a slightly <laughs> worse version. That's it. I wanted to do something a little bit different. And I think, I think that's cool. And that's a cool part of the family business. When it's family, you talk about communication within the M&A process. You have a family business. They're typically all involved and rowing the boat in the same direction to get that across the finish line. And that's the most fulfilling part and fun part of my job is typically business owners and family businesses within this space are some of the nicest, best people you've ever met. And they have typically put in, in many cases, decades of hard work. And from an M&A perspective, to be able to work for them that on the back of those decades of hard work creates what amounts to hopefully generational wealth in one moment is really cool and fun to be a part of. And business owners in the space are just the easiest people in the world to pull for. We're lucky in this industry to have so many good people. And, and you had talked about maybe the horror stories of working with family. I think we see it on the staffing side in how many maybe industry insiders will bash the industry. And a lot of times you hear from the vocal minority that really, you know, if you go to Facebook or you go to any of these platforms and, and read, go to Reddit, wherever you go, there's always some 
form of negativity. And it's very frustrating because as you mentioned, there are so many great stories out there of these families that have worked for decades and, and really put their, their heart into this thing. And uh, you, you hit on a point with me that I think is very, very important. And that is sharing those stories, those success stories, and not just from a monetary standpoint, but like there's just some really cool people that have some really cool stories out there. Well, and it's why I appreciate you doing what you do. And it's why I am involved in the podcast world with the Collision Vision by Auto Body News. I think those stories are so important to shed light on some of the positive pieces of our industry. For me, business books are kind of tough to digest of, of kind of the traditional business book, the, the preachy, like here, do this and your business will be better. You'll be a great CEO. To me, it was always the autobiographies and the stories of really successful entrepreneurs and business people, the ride of a lifetime by Bob Iger, shoe dog by Phil Knight that really hit great home book. because oh, it's my favorites and, and yeah. they're so easy to read, but it, it really hit home because you get lessons, but it's like you take what you need to take out of something that also entertains you. And that's what you're doing. That's, that's my goal. I think these are great assets for the industry to be able to share those great stories. We're going to touch on the podcast here next, but I do have to ask if you ever read the ESPN book, uh, we, we were talking about sports earlier, but it's a, it's a huge book, but it talks about the history of ESPN. And over the years, I've read a lot of these biography type of books uh, ESPN's was one that really sticks out to me because I think what helped me even as we were building the business is hearing those stories of like ESPN was almost closed so many times, like almost went out of business multiple times. Caterpillar almost went out of business multiple times. Like all of these huge global iconic brands didn't just start off being these huge global iconic brands like like it took some stress and ESPN story is fascinating to me because they were funded by like a like I don't know if it was Anheuser-Busch or something like that and the the story of how they kept getting money for their business is hilarious but it's also it's just uh it, I think it helps a lot of businesses when you when you understand the stories of some of these other people that have gone through stuff to, to say, Hey, it, it sometimes takes time to build something great. And it's, I know it's bought me some patience in, in my business and, uh, and such a hard thing to do is have patience, but knowing others have gone through it and reading those stories, uh, it, it, it's pretty, pretty big for me. That's well put. And I, I know the ESPN story from a super high level. I've written this down. I'm going to have to check out the book. I love it. But I, I think that's a really cool way to think about these stories from successful business people, typically these like traditional business books do this, you'll be successful. It's from a snapshot of somebody who's made it. I think these autobiographies are, are typically pretty open about the failures and the ups and downs that, that went along with these success stories. And to your point, I think it, it really helps you as a, a, a business owner or CEO to realize, like, hey, it's not a straight, straight upward line. There's going to be ups and downs. Let's talk about your podcast. You've got a really cool podcast. You're doing some amazing things. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, no, thank you for that. So uh, I, I'm the host of the Collision Vision podcast. It's a uh, podcast by Auto Body News, the leading industry publication in the collision repair world. And it's very much what we just talked about. It's an outlet for just some of the, the best and brightest minds in the collision repair and the wider automotive industry to come on, tell their story, talk about some of the leading topics in the industry every week, and just be of value to business owners and leaders within collision repair. For me, I, I was looking for something. I love business podcasts, interview format. It's really good. I, I didn't find one that was really business focused within this industry. And I think it, it's a, a huge need to hear these success stories of business owners that you might not know their name, but they are building or have built something just incredible. And it's been a lot of fun. We've had some incredible guests, uh, Mike Anderson, Dave Luer, Thomas Goforth of Absolute Collision, uh, people from Rivian, people from Lucid. It's, it's, it's a very, very cool, casual conversation with some incredible people, certainly people much smarter than I. 
I think that's the beauty in a podcast, right? It is it the ability to really pick somebody's brain and, and it's been fascinating to do this with you today because I think there's so much that I've learned in, in, I, I I'm interested, how, how did that come together? How did you end up in that podcast spot at, you know, in, in doing it with the group that you are? Yeah. So auto body news is a fantastic organization. I've been writing for them for, for a fair bit of time, just articles in their magazine. And we were kicking around further ideas to work together. And I said, Hey, I, I have this, uh, idea that I've been chewing on for a long time. I think it fills a need. And I, I sort of joke that I don't want to be another 30 year old dude with a podcast. I think it should be your <laughs> asset, your brand, and just let me play a role in it. And that's exactly what it's developed into. And it's been a, a great experience. And again, you yeah, had just some great partners there. What have you learned in doing the podcast? It, it, it's, I know from us, we started off like three years ago, not knowing anything about podcasting other than to flip the switch and just start talking. Uh, maybe you've got some tips or advice for me uh, because <laughs> I, I think we uh, we're always trying to grow and always trying to get better. Right. Uh, no, I, I, nothing I can give you. I think you, you guys do an incredible job from a, what I've learned standpoint. I think you'd agree with this. It's such a, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to speak with some dedicated time to the guests that we're able to get. It is such a cool thing. And I feel, and I, I'm sure you feel the same way, incredibly tapped into the happenings of our industry. And it's because we get to speak with every week, the people who know it better than anyone else. And that's really been the most fun part of the whole, the whole experience. I agree. It's like time almost stops during the course of the day. And it's a, uh we're always so busy putting out fires and running to do our thing. And it's the one time that you can just sit down and have a really nice, genuine conversation with somebody. And it's never really in a sales type atmosphere or uh, just, it's just having a good conversation with somebody that's like-minded and has a passion for the industry. And I, you know, I, I'm forever grateful that we were able to, to do a podcast and it's, um, it's one of those things I never, ever, ever, like you said, I didn't want to be another dude with a podcast, but it is also one of those things where it's just, it's been a huge benefit. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's so cool. I'm a better version of myself in my job for this and getting able to speak with people and hearing different ideas, different mindsets, different ways of looking at challenges within the, within the industry. And it's helped me immensely. And I'll tell you too, kind of going into this, the question arose both internally and by the Auto Body News team. It said, man, hey, a weekly podcast, that's a lot of work. We don't <laughs> need you getting burnt out. And I said, man, well, I'll, I'll let you know if it happens, but it's a valid point. And I don't know, every time I go into the studio, it had the opposite effect. I left energized and excited for what we had just recorded and put out there and learned. And it's, it's just been a lot of fun. Well, good for you, man. I, I, uh, I did read your bio. I saw where you went to college and you've got, I think, undergrad Ole Miss grad Florida. Yes. Yep. That's exactly How does that right. work? So this is always revolving around a sports question. So how, who do you root for? Uh, well, so the answer is easy, but I'll give a, a super quick backstory here. Oddly enough, I grew up a diehard Georgia Bulldogs fan. Wow. Parents went there grandparents went there, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, die hard. And I was the black sheep, right? Ended up going to <laughs> Ole Miss, ended up going to Ole Miss, but it was fine. We barely ever play each other. We're typically not super competitive. I could sort of be a fan of both. Ole Miss was not a deal breaker for my extended family. Fast forward to grad school. You're going to, to where? You're a Florida Gator? It about lost me some family members. I say in jest, everyone was super cool, but it, it did make it weird. So uh, by and large, though, by far, uh, I'm an Ole Miss Rebel fan. All right. I, I've heard the campus is beautiful. I, it's on my bucket list to go to a, a football game there sometime. I've never been to an SEC football game. I, I want to do that someday. That's on my bucket list. Uh, but I've always heard great, great things about Ole Miss. 
Well, let's make a trip to the Grove happen. It is world-class and an incredible spot to be. Well, I appreciate you joining the podcast and for all of the just truly amazing things you're doing for, for so many people out there and really to come on here and maybe help people understand it in a little bit more depth, uh, give you a, a ton of credit for what you do and, and thank you for everything you do for our industry. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much as well. And thank you for having me on here. Really enjoyed our conversation. Last, last thing, Cole, how do people find you? How do they reach out? We'll get it, we'll get it linked in the show notes, but I, I completely spaced. Great question. Uh, really active on LinkedIn. They can email me with any mergers and acquisitions, thoughts or questions at cole.strandberg at focusbankers.com. And they can learn more about the collision vision at autobodynews.com or anywhere they listen to their podcast. Thanks for coming on, bud. Thanks so much, Jay. That wraps up this week's episode of Beyond the Wrench. Be sure to tune in next week for another brand new episode. As a reminder, don't forget to rate and follow Beyond the Wrench on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps us get Beyond the Wrench in front of other fantastic shop owners, managers, technicians, and dealers just like you so we can continue to help improve, promote, and grow this amazing industry. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll be back next week.